Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. which 
had not healed the scars of slavery and dealt substantively with its racism. So I hated that flag. I hated that flag and what it represented. And I hated all who flew it because attendant to it was the pain and terror suffered by my people for over 400 years. They were my enemy, those who sought to destroy me and marginalize me. Now, journey with me to July of 2015, a day I shall never forget. Join me on my rounds at a hospital in Indiana on that historic day when the South Carolina Senate had the day before, on a vote of 36 to 3, decided to remove the Confederate flag from the State House grounds. On that day, I admitted a very gaunt and pale Caucasian male, 49 years old, who had been dwindling in health over the past two months, suffering extreme weakness, gastrointestinal problems, and weight loss. He could barely turn himself in bed. We would later discover that he had AIDS. I walked into his room that day and interviewed and examined him devising a plan at each step to attempt to diagnose and address his afflictions. As I leaned him forward to examine his back, there tattooed was the Confederate flag and underneath it the swastika. Below these symbols of hate were plastered the words Southern Brotherhood. Uh, now, now, I am at the intersection of dealing with my own emotions and doing my job. And it was as if I immediately heard our Lord say to me, as is recorded in this chapter from Luke, love your enemy. Here I am having to soothe and succor somebody who hated me and who thought me less than equal. How do I deal with my enemy? I wrestle with this question even now on a daily basis. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. I've been thinking deeply about this this week, about how to deal with my enemy, and even understanding the concept of an enemy. But what is an enemy? Is an enemy someone who has hurt us, I believe, beloved, an enemy is not simply someone who does or says something against us. A lot of people, including friends and family, can do and say things against us. But a person only becomes an enemy when what that person says or does causes us pain that we just can't shake off. You have to feel something for an enemy. It may be dislike, it may be loathing, hatred, disdain, or disgust. But you have to exert some passion and energy on an enemy. We've all heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But that's not true with an enemy. The words of an enemy hurt an enemy, then, I believe, is somebody who has gotten inside of your head and your heart. All of us have enemies. All of us have people who have hurt us, and all of us have hurt other people. The latter truth is what we are inclined to forget, though. We can remember. 
remember all the dirt that has been thrown upon us when we've done our share of dirt throwing and mudslinging, cutting, and being paid. There's a preacher who once broke up a fight, and when uh, he asked how it started, one of the boys said, he hit me, and I hit him back. And then he hit me, and I hit him again. At some point, beloved, it makes no difference who started the fight if the fight is the only reason that both people are keeping it going. At a certain point, one person is as guilty as the other. You are not obligated, beloved, to keep a fight going simply because somebody started it five, ten, twenty, or even a hundred years ago. Often, when we start trying to determine who started the fight, so much misunderstanding and miscommunication has taken place that we can't figure out the point at which the hard feelings started building up between people. One person tracks the problem to one incident or place or person or time, while the other person focuses on a different incident. Often, the war was taking place in the head and in the heart long before it broke out in the open. We all have enemies. We all have enemies for several reasons, I believe. First of all, I think we all have enemies because we make some. Sometimes we may not intend to hurt people, but we do. But other times we know just what we're doing, don't we? Then again, sometimes we have enemies because others set themselves up as our enemies. Here's what I mean. In some cases, people will dislike us if we represent in their eyes what they are not. It has been said that people will not hate you without a cause. But that is not true. There's always a cause may not be a good one. It may not be one we can do anything about. It may not be uh, one that, uh, it may be one that, that neither we nor they can put our finger on, but there's always a cause. I don't like him. But why? I don't know. <laughs> I just don't. Jealousy and insecurity are two of the basic reasons people become enemies. If a person is insecure and doesn't like himself or herself, and you are self-confident, that person may dislike you. If a person doesn't like his or her looks and considers you attractive, that person may dislike you. If a person is weak in body and you are healthy, that person may dislike you. If a person is not very popular and you are popular, that person may dislike you. If a person is not very smart or just average and you are very smart, that person may dislike you. If a person is lazy and you're doing things, that person may dislike you. If a person doesn't have much and you have a whole lot, that person may dislike you. If a person is in his or her declining years and you are young and have the best years ahead of you, that person may dislike you. Am I down your street yet? <laughs> Sometimes people are your enemies because they don't like themselves. And it's easier for them to hurt you than it is for them to experience in a healing. So we have enemies because we make some. We have enemies because some people set themselves up as our enemies. But then, beloved, I believe we have enemies because the devil is going to give us some. Amen. Particularly if we are trying to serve God. 
The enemy is going to put people in our lives to try our spirit and our patience. The enemy is going to put folk around us to sap our joy and try to break our determination and turn us around. Sometimes we wonder to ourselves, what have we done to make people dislike us? Well, if you have a vision, if we're trying to do the right thing, if we're trying our best to live a Christian life and treat others like we want to be treated, that's enough for the devil to dislike us and raise up foes to try to defeat us. And the devil is smart enough to use those closest to us. Because I believe the devil realizes that termites can do more damage to a house eating away on the inside than woodpeckers can do on the outside. You preach it now. The only way to avoid making the devil your enemy is to want nothing worthwhile, do nothing worthwhile, become nothing worthwhile, stand for nothing worthwhile, talk about nothing worthwhile, think about nothing worthwhile, live for nothing worthwhile, and ultimately die for nothing worthwhile. We all have enemies. Even Jesus had it. And beloved, he got his the same way we get ours. Some he made. You know, statements to the effect that prostitutes and tax collectors would enter the kingdom before the Pharisees and Sadducees. And in his calling these religious leaders hypocrites. But these are not things that make friends of our enemies. And then the Pharisees and Sadducees did their part to keep the gap wide by trying to undermine everything Jesus did because they were jealous of the masses that heard him gladly. Further, beloved, I believe because the devil knew what would happen to him if Jesus ever succeeded, he set up a host of enemies including outsiders like the Roman government and the religious hierarchy and insiders like Jesus' trusted disciples and family members like his own brothers and sisters. And so I was led this week as I grappled with this concept of dealing with my enemy. I was led to a text in the book of Acts which spoke to me of God's grace. And by God's grace, I believe it may speak to you also. Briefly, in the book of Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19, there's a story of Paul uh, after he had been on the road to Damascus and was blinded. Verse 10 starts, Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went into the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. In this text, Ananias, who was a devoted follower of Jesus, very devoted, was being asked to do one of the hardest things that he would ever be asked to do. 
Ananias was instructed to face an enemy, and not only face an enemy, but to heal him. An overbearing and overzealous Saul had disrupted the church in Jerusalem and was on his way to Damascus to do the same thing. And on the Damascus road that led to the city, Saul experienced the risen Christ who asked him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. After the heavenly visitation, Saul was blinded. He was struck blind, and for three days and three nights, he was without sight, and he ate and drank nothing. Now, now let me pull over here for just a minute to state the obvious, what some of us are probably thinking. When bad things happen to our enemy, we typically react by saying, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> Good for him. God don't like ugly. While we may not wish for the misfortune of people who have hurt us, when something bad happens to them, we can't help but feel that they are getting what they deserve. Oh, can't you hear Ananias in your imagination talking to God? Heal him? Do you know who Saul is? Have you forgotten what he did to the church in Jerusalem? Isn't he here in Damascus to do this heal him? We've been praising you because he is blind. We thought that the blindness was a blessing from you to protect us. But hear God's word to Ananias. Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. How do you heal somebody that wants to harm you? Beloved, before Ananias could face Saul, God had to prepare Ananias' heart and frame of mind. And I submit to all of us today, that before we can face our enemies with the right spirit, we have to ask God to first prepare us. Or perhaps that's why we have had so little success in dealing with our enemies. Uh, we are so busy praying over them and about them and asking the Lord to fix them that we fail to ask God to fix us. You cannot face an enemy who has hurt you under your own power. You already know that. There is too much hurt that hasn't been healed, too much misunderstanding and confusion that hasn't been cleared up, too much resentment that wants to be satisfied and avenged. When we've been hurt, it's natural to want to inflict pain on the person responsible. That's why we have to ask Jesus to prepare us to face our enemies. We have to come clean. And we have to confess, Lord, I know what your word says, but I cannot face this person in my own strength. I cannot forgive this person by my own power. I need you to do something within me. I need a new heart. I, I need a new attitude. I, I need some new thoughts. I, I need you to direct my words. I need you to correct my motives. I need you to help me select the right time. Even if the field has been prepared for the seed, I need you to make me physically fit and ready to work in that field. Lord, I need you to work on me. It's hard to pray that prayer when we are relating to an enemy with the Confederate flag and swastika tattooed to their back. Because our tendency is to see everything that's wrong with the enemy. But if what's wrong between us and someone else is to be fixed, then we have to face ourselves 
and ask the Lord to fix us. Ananias was hesitant because of what Saul had done. Saul's blindness, however, was an indication that God had him under control. That makes me happy when I think about that. God had him under control. Sometimes, beloved, we are fearful about facing enemies. We don't want to go certain places because we might run into certain people. We walk around looking over our shoulders, afraid that our enemies are behind us. But this lesson reminds us that not only was Ananias in God's hands, but Saul, his enemy, was under God's control. That's why we need not fear our enemies. The same hand that holds us controls them. The same hand that makes ways for us so that we can walk through the Red Sea on dry ground is the same hand that clogs Pharaoh's chariot wheels in the mud when he comes in behind us. The same eyes that are watching over us are also watching them. That's why our walk needs to be close to God. Because when we walk close to God, our enemies can't get but so close to us. So following heaven's instructions, Ananias went to the house where Saul was staying, laid his hands upon him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately Saul's eyesight was restored. Oh, beloved, if you ask the Lord to prepare you first, and if you understand that you have nothing to fear because no enemy is bigger than our God, then the Lord will make you bigger than your enemies. Because the Lord has prepared you. And because the Lord has prepared you, instead of trying to break your enemies, here's the thing, you will end up blessing them. Just knowing that you have the victory will be reward enough. The Lord will help you to heal rather than hurt, bless rather than battle, and pray for them rather than persecute them. We'll be able to say to those who have hurt us deeply, as Joseph did to his brothers when they sold him into slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We need divine help facing our enemies. The same Jesus who helped Ananias, who prepared Ananias, who gave Ananias the victory, who put healing in the hands of Ananias is able to help you and me. The same Jesus will make a man who was culturally conditioned for hate, so much so that he tattooed a permanent imprimatur of terrorism and racism and horror on his body. This same Jesus will have him saying as he did to me at his bedside, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you, and I'm so thankful for you taking care of me. Thank you, my friend. I am so thankful for what you're doing for me. May God bless you. Amen.